I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. The millennials and post-millennials, will one or both of these cohorts rescue the American political process from its seemingly incessant dysfunction, rancor, and hate-mongering? Stephen Alakara is here to answer that question. He's the founding president of the Millennial Action Project, a national nonpartisan organization dedicated to activating millennial policymakers to overcome partisan entrenchment. In this role, Stephen organized the nation's first bipartisan caucus for young members of Congress, the Future Caucus. This past week, as of this recording, Stephen and his colleagues convened in Milwaukee to host the project's Red and Blue Dialogue series with newly elected office holders and community stakeholders. Milwaukee is not only special as my hometown, Stephen reflected, but also as the epicenter of political polarization and segregation in this country. Stephen, those were poignant words. Thank you for sharing them with me. Thanks as, for having me. Of course, a pleasure. Can you reflect on your experience in Milwaukee just this past week? Sure. Well, I first of all love Milwaukee. It's a great town, great music, great culture, great sports. But one of the things, as you referenced, about the greater Milwaukee area is it really is according to studies, the most politically segregated metro area in the United States. And I grew up in that environment. Before I got into politics, I was playing music, actually, primarily jazz. And so my music kind of spanned across these major political divides. And as you mentioned, last week, uh, we hosted uh, these red and blue dialogues in Milwaukee and where we brought together our local future caucus members who are young and new elected office holders, along with the community. And it's really powerful because in this air moment of divisive politics to see community members who really want to rise above the tribalism and the lack of respect we have for different viewpoints is, is really encouraging actually. And at the end of the dialogue, a number of people said, I thought we had a lot that a lot more in common th than we expected. And so this is just the beginning. And, you know, I really believe that change does come from the bottom up. And so if we can model the type of leadership, the type of political discourse we need, it can really start to make a big difference. Stephen, you perceive that to be a plurality or maybe even a majority who are not just fed up with dysfunction, which is a longstanding American pastime, yeah. but want to engage and see themselves as solution makers? That's exactly right. I mean, you have the data, but also just the larger cultural shift here. On the data side, a plurality of millennials are rejecting both political parties right now. And I think they're really rejecting a two-party duopoly that is really holding our country back and is creating the type of tribalism in our politics today. And, and for millennials, what you see is we kind of want both, and I often call us the a la carte generation. We believe that we need to, for example, take on the debt and we need to do something about climate change. And so we are seeing that, which is really encouraging. But beyond that, with these young and new elected officials that we work with, they are done with the partisanship. They want to get over that and start working on solutions. I mean, if you think about it, you get elected at a young age, you're probably impatient by nature. And you, that, that impatience, I think, translates to how they can, you know, pragmatically work together to find a solution. And, you know, I think that ultimately represents our democracy at its finest when we marshal the best ideas from all sides to and ultimately build consensus on the great challenges facing our country. Now, we're not doing that yet in mainstream politics, but we are starting to see it bubble up at the millennial level. You were telling me an encouraging development in the state of Ohio right. with your future caucus and one particular representative working to end the process of gerrymandering. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So the process of gerrymandering has taken place for maybe 200 years in this country, but as a result of technology and increasing tribalism, that you have seen an extreme level of gerrymandering take place recently. And we saw our, our future caucus and our co-chair in Ohio do something that no one thought was pop possible. Ohio, which is a state gerrymandered for the partisan benefit of uh, Republicans there, uh, has been uh, has caused uh, an, an, a level of distrust there in just the way that they draw the districts. And our Republican co-chair, State Senator Frank LaRose, introduced the bipartisan legislation to effectively end uh, gerrymandering in the state. This was a year ago when 
a number of people thought this was impossible. A lot of, as you can imagine, establishment Republicans were actually against it. And they were all saying, like, this guy's crazy. I asked him at one of our Millennial Action Project forums, you know, Senator LaRose, how are you doing this? Is, wouldn't, isn't it at, at the expense of your own party's benefit? And he said, no. I think we should win because we have the best candidates and the best ideas, not because we cheated our voters. Over the course of a year, uh, Frank and others on the ground built support. He's, we then launched our Democracy Reform Task Force, which he's a member of and provided additional uh, support. And ultimately, he was able to get the bill passed through the legislature. And then just recently, the voters approved it with 75 percent of the vote. This is not only an extraordinary example of leadership, but also how you know, voters are willing to go beyond their own tribal self-interest in the betterment of their own government. And these stories, unfortunately, are too rare and are, far, uh, are, are too, covered far too rarely. Um, but you know, this is a great example of a step in the right direction. You do have a federal congressional element within your future caucus. Yeah. You were naming those representatives, and I think our viewers would like to know who they are. Sure. They have not been able to bring to the floor of the U.S. House or to the Senate any of the kinds of legislation that would garner and engender bipartisan support. Is that right? Well, well I, I think we, we've seen actually quite a bit of uh, momentum at the congressional level, uh, not as much as maybe you would see at the state level, just because things move a bit slower in, in Congress. But our uh, leadership team, which includes you know Congresswoman Kirsten Sinema, Congressman Carlos Curbelo, Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy, and Congressman Mike Gallagher, a bipartisan uh, leadership team, we have about 30 members in total. They actually have, at the beginning of this year, for example, introduced a bipartisan bill uh, to help veterans seek employment uh, and get skills training for these new technological uh, areas. And another good example is recently when the uh, Parkland students came to Washington, D.C., and they were shaking the moral conscience of this country and said, we need to go beyond party to reduce gun violence in this country. Our uh, leadership team with Congressman Murphy really leading the charge there was able to get bipartisan support on a bill to lift a decades long ban on the CDC from studying gun violence as a public health issue. The first Republican to sign on was our co-chair, Carlos Cabello. The second was another member. More and more Republicans signed on. Ultimately, it passed and got signed into law. So at this juncture, the CDC can do research on the effects of gun violence. Yeah. Something now, that had been barred. It had been barred, exactly, exactly. And these are the type of... Incremental. Yeah, incremental, incremental change, incremental change. In contrast to what was an amazing achievement in Ohio. Right. And you're right, the press far too seldom rarely cover these developments. Right. But in part, Stephen, isn't it because that bipartisan future caucus and the like-minded solutions-oriented problem solvers caucus in the House of Representatives, right. they're not focused on the issues that are most covered, like right. the Mueller probe or undocumented or illegal immigration right. or the dreamers. Um, those political crises, uh, which may well become constitutional crises, given the current climate, um, demand that the four representatives you describe are not just part of the future, but part of the present. Yeah. How can you get them to be part of the present? Well, you know, that's a very good question. When we started Millennial Action Project, we very strategically started choosing issues that would uh, build momentum to more and more difficult uh, efforts. So, for example, we started working on issues like entrepreneurship and how you can build crowdfunding for these new startups. Another big one for us was the sharing economy, Airbnb, Uber, Lyft. How do you embrace innovation but also protect consumers? So these were the types of issues that were not so much left versus right, but more generational. And as a result, those members were able to build relationships across the aisle. And I often 
liken bipartisanship to like muscle building. It's a muscle that needs to be exercised, and over time it becomes muscle memory. So now that we have this momentum, we have these early wins, you can start taking on bigger ticket items. And what's been really great is to see how even the sort of side effects of her work can translate to the, the big issue. So you mentioned immigration. Right now, Congressman Curbelo is leading out an effort to force a vote on immigration reform uh, that would be bipartisan so we can protect uh, the dreamers. And a lot of the people leading that effort are you know, part of our, our caucus, and they trust him because of the work that they've done previous to this time. The reality, though, tragic reality yeah. of the current Congress is that Speaker Ryan refuses to put any legislation that might have bipartisan consensus right. compromise on the floor. Right, right. How do you address that problem? Yeah. So and what you're referring to here is the this issue of the Hassert rule, which says you need a majority of the majority to uh, bring a bill to the floor. Of course, that's not in the Constitution. That's basically a norm that has been created uh, by uh, speakers over the years. And so that is something we need to change. And so what you're getting at is a much larger issue of how do we move towards nonpartisan governance? And it's our belief, this is why we're so bullish on the next generation, it's our belief that those who are most likely to change the process are those who have not been made comfortable by and profiting off of the system as it has been for the last 30, 40 years. It's going to be these reform-minded young members who are willing to challenge the status quo. And we've already seen this. A lot of our members I'll highlight Congressman Mike Gallagher, for example, who really has been willing to step outside of his party's norm uh, to be working on reform type issues. And, uh, and I think that's been very encouraging. Another good example related to that is the need for a cooling off period for uh, re uh, retiring uh, congressional members as they're going into federal, uh, federal lobbying. Uh, currently, there's uh, just a one-year ban, uh, and they're proposing to increase it to five years. Because if you think about it, members really shouldn't be just trading on their influence and profiting off of it. And so these are the types of reforms that, again, you're not seeing from the establishment, but are absolutely necessary for us to actually start trusting our government again. And the Parkland students in particular epitomize a group of young people post-millennials, yeah. you and I are millennials. Yeah, we're already old, Alexander. Right. <laughs> but these are folks who've come of age in a climate of persistent dysfunction right. in which they didn't see any compromise. Mm -hmm. We have barely memories, but we do have those memories of the 90s and the post-9-11 culture, which was resilient America, patriotic. And this right. leads me to this question, which is there is a feistiness maybe born out of the social media moment mm -hmm within the post-millennials that was not present in the millennials and, and not the Obama coalition either. That right. was not, a, I wouldn't call that a, a feisty. It was yeah. courageous, but it wasn't feisty. Yeah, yeah. Parkland has a feistiness, mm -hmm. rightly so, um, but isn't there a signal, a tacit signal from the retirements of all these congressional officials? Mm -hmm. You allude to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of Congressman Dent in particular yeah, from yeah. Pennsylvania that in order to restore our democracy right now, we need to have a check on the executive. And that right. means that patriotic Republicans, mm -hmm. um, like the mm -hmm. Florida congressman yeah. you mentioned, right. have to stand up and say, well, we need one of these chambers to be a check on this president because yeah. of the persistence of corruption in his administration, yeah. which is just the reality. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Congress has to reassert its role as the uh, check on the executive during Democratic administrations and Republican administrations. And a good example of this is the fact that we just let now presidents uh, start declaring war and uh, start interfering abroad without the congressional approval that is required uh, in the Constitution. And so I completely agree on that point that we need a new group of members in Congress who, who believe that Congress needs to be passing a budget, that needs to be authorizing wars, that needs to be providing an appropriate, appropriate accountability to uh, the executive branch. It gets to the fundamental value of uh, separation of powers. And so, I, I mean, we have seen a number of our, our members say, for example, that we need to make sure that Robert Mueller is protected. Uh, but unfortunately, we are still 
uh, living in a highly tribal uh, environment. Uh, we uh, are not seeing the levels of uh, patriotism required, I think, of our major elected officials who are really driving the day to day uh, to, in, in order to uh, be putting a proper uh, check on the executive. And I think that's a huge problem. Not to say that, by the way, I think there's been a huge obsession also on this uh, probe as well. Um, and, the, and I agree with a lot of my conservative friends who I talk to in, in Wisconsin that, look, we're missing out on some of the major challenges of the day if 100 percent of our attention is on uh, the investigation as well. And I just think one of the great challenges we face right now is the historic level of distrust. I mean, in the 1960s, trust in government and our institutions was closer to 80 percent. Today, it's down to about 15 percent. That is not sustainable in a democracy. And if we're not having a national conversation about the ways we can reform our political process and our Congress, then I'll tell you what, the type of energy we saw electing Trump in 2016 is just the beginning if we don't actually enact some real reforms in the right. near term. That energy can be channeled in support of a congressional candidate running in your home state. Yeah. Um, Randy Bryce, yeah. who's seeking to replace uh, the speaker. Yeah. If you ask Congressman Corbello yeah. if he'd rather keep his seat or elect a Democratic majority, you know, because yeah. I think he is a patriot, yeah. I think he would say the latter. He would rather the chamber become mm -hmm. not beholden to the administration mm -hmm. That's right. than actually preserve his own seat. Yeah, right. I mean, a major shift you're actually seeing amongst the younger folks getting elected today, and again, the first of our generation, the millennials are now getting elected to these offices, is a view that politics and an elected office is not a long-term career. They see it in the view that the founders really saw it, which is a citizen legislature. You go and serve in public office, write laws, and then you move back into private life to live under those laws. And I really feel like we're bringing that back now. And so if you think about some of those young elected officials you referenced, they're not afraid to be courageous. They're not afraid to get voted out either. They believe that public service truly is a public service. They need to get the things done, do the right thing. And, uh, and ideally, uh, you know, the way leadership works is you have to bring people with you. You have to make a public case for why you're doing X, Y, and Z. And then ideally they, they come with you. But, you know, one of my favorite books is uh, Profiles Encouraged by President Kennedy. And he highlights, you know, U.S. senators who in many cases lost their political careers for, for doing the right thing. And, and I often say the most uh, scarce resource in politics today is courage and we need more of it. I was thinking of the same book yeah. and the fact that, as I've said on the show, there have been profiles and cowardice that have mm -hmm. dominated our politics of late the millennials and post-millennials coming to the fore now hopefully will bring back the courage, yeah. uh, even if they're risking their own uh, electoral chances moving on. But how is your project considering the necessity mm. of this kind of patriotic duty to not just install constructive decision and policy making, but that accountability the most important thing we're doing right now is trying to build a governing culture and a governing structure that's capable of building consensus. And without that, the further our political institutions degrade. And you, you were referencing how the post-millennials have grown up in this era of dysfunction. And that's all Gen Zers know, and that's largely all you and I and our generation knows as well. And so what, and, and what the culture and the structural changes will do is create an environment where we are not so tribal as, as you're referencing here, where we are actually building accountability into government. Because in the wake of that, or in the absence of that, then it is the politics of resentment. And, and as, as Kathy Kramer Walsh uh, references, it's, it, it, you're, and, and George Washington references in his farewell address as well, is you know, when you have these kind of warring factions just going up against each other, then you start to see revenge-like behavior at the expense of norms, values, and, uh, and the real ideals of, of this country. So that's our, the contribution I believe we are making and will continue to make is, again, a cultural 
change in the way that we govern that's much more nonpartisan and collaborative, and then the structural reforms that are required and to ensure that we have a system that people trust and also a, a governing process where it is more possible to build consensus on, on the big issues. Just to give you a sense, on the structural side, that the reforms that are very important are, for example, ranked choice voting, having an opening, open primary system that will allow more uh, moderate candidates to emerge, but also people who uh, aren't just having to appeal to the extremes who come out in, in low turnout uh, primaries. Uh, and then similarly, as we're referencing earlier, the Hassert rule needs to go. There needs to be a, a more nonpartisan way that we're bringing bills uh, for, up for consideration. And then the, another big one is uh, the way that we're financing campaigns. And we've seen so many young candidates who start running for office and the number one factor, whether they are successful or not, is how many rich people do they know? And that is totally insane. But we are starting to see some uh, positive reforms. One good example is in Connecticut, where they have a system of uh, what they call the clean elections law, where you have to raise some small dollar donations to demonstrate you're a legitimate candidate. Then you get some funding from uh, the government and you can run a competitive campaign. What's really interesting is it was young legislators who really have championed that law and protected it in the face of a number of threats. Those young legislators are pivotal to achieving those outcomes that you just described. Yeah. And there is a mountain to climb. Yeah. And there is a tsunami right now of that resentment that is so deeply embedded in our, in our politics right. in no small measure because of Donald Trump and his particularly vicious and hyper-partisan politics. Remember, he said he was this negotiator who was going to work with both parties because he alone could fix our problems. Right. Well, it turns out he, his, his soul, if he has one, was bought and sold, yeah. sold to the radical extreme. Right. Did millennials not make a mistake that I think their post-millennial brethren are learning from? Mm -hmm. They didn't run for office. Mm -hmm. They started Facebook and Twitter, mm -hmm. and they galvanized people, initially for good, right. then for bad, but enough, not enough, young people ran and sought office um, over the last decade. And millennials engaged in volunteerism, but not in elected office. Mm -hmm. Was that not a lesson that these post-millennials need to learn? Right. The Cameron Keskis yeah. and right. David Hoggs, they have to run for office. Well, they certainly do. And, and I think now, not just the Gen Zers, but also millennials who are actually old enough to be running for most of these offices now, you're seeing a huge, huge wave of uh, young people deciding to run in the current, uh, you know, 2018 midterm elections. But to get to your broader point here, one of the dichotomies we noticed when we were first deciding to found this organization was the fact that millennials have the highest levels of service participation rates in the country as volunteerism and, you know, social entrepreneurship, and yet the least trust and confidence in government. And so you had this... Uh, you know, civic idealism to government participation gap that uh, did create a huge problem. And I do think you saw a number of our best and brightest going not into public service, but many other uh, careers, including uh, technology and moving out to Silicon Valley. And so that is absolutely uh, an issue. Um, but the good news is that people are waking up right now. And a lot of them are trying to figure out not only who they, how they run for office, but also um, how they can be part of a number of these uh, larger reforms to the system. And I'll make one prediction here. I think this November, we'll see the highest midterm voter turnout ever for millennials. How are millennials and post-millennials going to rescue the heartland and in particular, your native Wisconsin? <laughs> well, you're right. I mean, I think the Rust Belt has been uh, a decisive factor in American politics recently. And part of the reason for that is because you've had the hollowing out of the industrial sector of the economy and you've had a lot of people lose their jobs and they've been out of work for a long period of time. And, and for those who have worked, their median incomes after adjusting for inflation has been largely you know, stagnant. And so you have people who are just frustrated with the economic situa situation, but then they see their politicians who are just shouting at each other all the time. They realize, I have no connection to or no agency to really you know, change things. And so I'm, I'm really optimistic, though. I'm hopeful that things will change. And I think if you think about Wisconsin, you do have uh, a number of 
Uh, millennials who are in uh, not only Milwaukee and Madison, but also uh, in a couple weeks, we're doing an event with millennials up in Appleton uh, in the Fox Valley, which is uh, close to Green Bay, uh, Wisconsin. And you have uh, you know, young, professionals, young professionals who are uh, getting engaged. The real question is where that energy will be channeled, where, the, where that frustration will be channeled. Will, will there be political leaders who will inspire us not to just serve our worst tribal instincts, but ultimately serve the better angels of our nature in these very divisive times. And I'll never forget Kathy Kramer saying Mm -hmm. here that it was rural Wisconsinites who were blaming Madison because of a perception that all state government was doing was serving people who did not look like them. That's right. All state government was doing was implementing an affirmative action program, which was not helping them, yeah. which was denying them opportunity. Last predictions, yeah. because we're running out of time. Yeah. Does Randy Bryce win, <laughs> uh, and does Governor Walker win a third term? I'll make a couple predictions yeah. here, and we'll see how well they do. I think, uh, first of all, the Randy Bryce seat is uh, a seat that's just basically the Chicago suburbs, really, um, but also just uh, south of Milwaukee and really the heart of the Rust Belt. You had a General Motors plant closed down in Janesville. And and so I I think the voters there are really frustrated. I think ultimately it really will be a toss up now that uh, Paul Ryan has said he's uh, And Scott Walker. And for Governor Walker, I actually think that his uh, organizational base in Wisconsin is extremely strong. And unfortunately, the Democratic field of candidates is extremely weak. You have about 10 or so candidates who are running. The rest Um, is history. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. We're out of time, Stephen. It's been a pleasure. Thank Thank you you. for your work. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.